uh, which is the subject of these lectures. So uh, I will express some, a little bit of solidarity with my UIC colleagues and give a <laughs> talk on the Blackboard. So um, let me maybe talk a little bit about motivation or rather not motivation, but to put uh, the subject into perspective uh, of, of other things that have been going on recently. So um, we are looking uh, to, to, to study uh, so-called mic micro-local structure of the various uh, fluid equations. So if we want to understand how uh, fluid equations uh, react or how they propagate um, highly, solid, highly oscillatory small-scale structures. Um, and that's, that's sort of, that kind of idea is behind many of the problems that, that uh, uh, we study. So maybe uh, at least some of them, uh, turbulence in general uh, is, is uh, you can put it in the category of uh, questions of uh, how uh, large scale structures affect small scale structures. Um, geometric optics in general Uh, deals with uh, such uh, small-scale structures and, uh, in fact, gives an attempt maybe to study these, um, uh, study those uh, systematically. Uh, more recently, the appearance of H principle uh, for the Euler equations and other equations, active scalar equations, um, is another manifestation of uh, the subject. And maybe also ill-posedness Uh, in various Sobolev, critical Sobolev um, and Besov spaces. And here I refer to recent results of uh, Bourguin and, uh, and Don Lee about uh, 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 ill-posedness uh, blow up in, in critical Sobolev spaces, uh, critical for application of energy methods. Um, and also more recently Masmoudi uh, uh, Gerard Misiolik uh, and, and Tarek, uh, ill-posedness in, in, um, in Hölder spaces. So all this have to do with understanding how small structures evolve, how they interact. And uh, lastly, the subject of these lectures is short wave instabilities. Okay, and let me explain what short wave instabilities are. So typically, if you study uh, instability of a certain steady state, okay, for example, just a parallel shear flow for the 2D Euler equation, um, you write down the linearized system, okay, and you try to find some eigenvalues, right, some, some eigenvalues. So it turns out that there may be many of these eigenvalues, and um, the rate, exponential rate of growth of these eigenvalues somehow is intimately related to the frequency of the eigenfunctions through some kind of dispersion relation. Okay, there's a frequency of the steady state and uh, it produces single, or rather the other way around maybe. Uh, for to each exponential growth there corresponds one frequency. Okay. Now short work instability on the other hand are of different kind. Here, oh, this is long. Uh, for short wave instability, there is no such a dispersion relation. In other words, for, for uh, a given uh, exponential growth rate, you may produce a sequence of maybe not exact but approximate eigenfunctions that, uh, that, that are more and more frequent. So they weakly tend to zero. So a typical short wave instability is the one which you produce a sequence of approximate eigenfunctions, which in your favorite state space produce uh, the decay for the spectral problem, yet they remain of order one, and they tend to zero weakly. In a very specific sense, they oscillate. They don't just concentrate, but they oscillate. Okay, so this is the principal difference between long and short. Um, so as you can see uh, from a mathematical point of view, the distinction between long and short means the classification of the spectrum, right? Uh, long, way, long instabilities correspond to the point spectrum. So the discrete or point spectrum of the uh, 
linear problem, and this corresponds to some kind of continuous spectrum. Okay, and there are many definitions of a continuous spectrum in the literature. Uh, perhaps the most extreme ones are the Fredholm spectrum and the Browder essential spectrum, which is the complement of the set of uh, isolated eigenvalues with finite multiplicities, where the resolvent has a pole. Uh, so these extreme uh, definitions of essential spectrum, it turns, as it turns out, for many equations of fluid dynamics are equivalent. They're the same. Uh, and in those cases, when they're, they're not the same, we, all, uh, all, uh, we know the, 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 the max that by the Nussbaum theorem, classical Nussbaum theorem, that the uh, maximal point in all those spectrum will be the same, okay? The, the maximum absolute value of the, uh, the, spe the spectral radii in all these es essential spectra are the same, okay? So uh, the question is, uh, where do they appear? Okay, so this is a classical setup. Where did the, the first time short wave instabilities appear? They appeared experimentally. And uh, in the 80s, there were many, uh, there were many experiments and numerical and the physical and uh, here there are many names, but I'm just gonna mention the name of Arzak, who was basically the common denominator among, you know, in, in many uh, articles and, and experiments. They first noticed that these short of instabilities, they appear first time when, uh, uh, in a transition to turbulence. They facilitate faster transition to turbulence than otherwise would, would have been predicted by lin the linear, linear theory. And uh, later on, they tried to come up with some prototypes of such instabilities. So one of the remarkable uh, instability of this type that occurred and was discovered in the 80s as a part of this uh, uh, extensive studies, it actually collected conferences at that time, uh, is elliptic instability. So basically, you're looking at uh, two-dimensional ideal flow with elliptic stream streamlines. Uh, if you perturb this flow on a plane, uh, two-dimensional, use two-dimensional perturbation, it's gonna be stable, okay? But if you use third dimension, so look at this as sort of vortex tubes now, and uh, it turns out that uh, you can use uh, the following ansatz, okay? Plug it into the Euler equation, linearize the Euler equation, and write down the evolution equations for B, for the amplitude and the frequency, and it turns out that uh, if you direct your frequency in a uh, vertical, not exactly vertically, but at a certain angle to the uh, Z axis, it will rotate counter, counter, I mean, it will just rotate around the axis and uh, the equation for the amplitude becomes a Floquet problem, which has a, no, a positive Floquet exponent. Um, so it was the first manifestation how the structure of instabilities occurs and these kind of structures, of course, of course occur uh, all, over, uh, all over the fluid, right? We, if you look at a two-dimensional uh, motion, you will, you will see these coherent structures appearing, uh, which have these elliptic points. And if you now add this third dimension, they become exponentially unstable. Okay. So uh, people at that time were very excited and they drew connection to the, back to the turbulence. They thought that um, this kind of behavior, behavior is an example how the large scale structure if directly affect small scale, small scale structures. So there should be some kind of energy cascade going on. Uh, but to be honest, after all these speculations and after the mathematical theory that appeared afterwards that I will talk about, it never came back to the turbulence. So it would be nice to actually uh, make this connection more precise in a sense. Okay, so what are the mathematical, tool, mathematical tools to study this? So these were laid out in the 90s through 2010, maybe, um, by several people, uh, Lipschitz, Mary, uh, Friedlander, Vishik, and more recently, Latushkin and myself. Um, the mathematical development came in, came in several installments, in fact. So the modern understanding of this thing is the following. So let's suppose that you have some kind of non-dissipative equation which has a steady state and results in some kind of linear linearization. Okay. Um, what 
what do we require of this system? Of course, there's, uh, there, there's some kind of divergence-free condition always, right? Or if you work with SQG or Porous Media, that may be a scalar, right? So there may or may not exist. Or if you're working with a really tailored situation, non-homogeneous fluid, uh, you may have divergence-free on some components of your, steady, of your state vector, and some may not. So how do you generalize that? Divergence-free condition in the physical space is differential, but in the Fourier space, it's geometric, right? It's just saying that somehow the Fourier transform of your field belongs to some space, which depends on the frequency. Divergence-free condition, of course, means that F is equal to perpendicular, space perpendicular to the line of the frequency vector, okay? So it's a geometric condition. So we require that these spaces, okay, they're, they're uh, zero homogeneous, and they form a smooth bundle. Over the, over the unit sphere, okay? Uh, let me here, uh, maybe for this discussion, set a fluid domain to be periodic, okay? Uh, what else do we require? Okay, so what do we need about, to know about the structure of this operator L that kind of generalizes many fluid models? We assume that L is given by advection, okay? So here U naught belongs to C2, C1 is a steady state, okay? Plus, in general, some pseudo-differential perturbation, bounded pseudo-differential perturbation with uh, a symbol which is semi-classical, which means that uh, there's a principal symbol which belongs to the zero Hermander class, zero homogeneous with respect to C, infinitely smooth, and A1 belongs to lower order class, so it's a smoothing operator, and uh, as, as smoothing operator, it is in fact a compact operator from L2 to L2, let's say. So, okay. okay. Well, when you talk about compact operators, uh, well, sorry, when we talk about short-wave instabilities, uh, somehow compact perturbations don't matter much because they would send uh, any weakly convergent, a weakly null sequence to the strongly null sequence, right? So it is important that uh, uh, here we're talking about torus, uh, otherwise these kind, of, these kind of conditions wouldn't guarantee compactness. And we're going to talk about it a little bit later because uh, in the case of porous media or Rayleigh-Taylor, this is not very much natural uh, so fluid domain to talk about, so it's just an infinite one. Um, so, well, what do I mean by the operator? Well, the classical to the differential operator, uh, at x it's the oscillatory integral a x y c e to the i c dot x minus y uh, v y dy dx. Uh, here, generally, you can define it over a topological group, and these define hard measures on top of. So, if you're talking about periodic case, these integrals are actually sums. If you're talking about periodic cross open, this is going to be direct products of uh, the corresponding measures. So, I'm going to put a general group G and the dual. Okay. So, um, so how to, how to study the spectral problem for this? So the approach is the geometric optics approach. So what we do is we want to understand how this equation, um, the f effective dynamics under this evolution of the highly oscillatory localized perturbations. So we take a point x naught, um, it gets evolved at time t to a new point uh, along the uh, streamline of the steady state, okay? So we're going to look at os uh, the localized amplitude oscillating in with some frequency, okay? So later on, it will evolve into something localized around x of t, oscillating in a possibly different direction. So initially, we're looking at 
this and that's plus initial condition plus capital O of epsilon, and we make a geometric optics on that, Vxt equals Bxt, Eisxt divided by epsilon plus capital O of epsilon, where S is the amplitude, uh, S is the uh, phase, and the gradient of S, of course, is the frequency, okay? So you make this prediction about this evolution, plug it into the equation, and use various properties of the two differential operators. We know how two differential operators behave on these oscillatory uh, functions. They're gonna localize, okay? They're gonna localize onto something of the following, onto multiplication operator of this sort, okay? So somehow this non-local behavior becomes local and you can write down, write uh, out the equations for the evolution of the uh, amplitude and phase. Instead, we're gonna write down the evolution equation for the, uh, for the frequency because all, everything is gonna depend on the gradient of S. Okay, so we have three equations. First of all, we have Lagrangian coordinates, evolution along the streamlines of the steady state. We have evolution of the frequency, which evolves as, a, as the usual uh, covector, okay? Propagated along the streamlines as a covector. And the amplitude, which is most important, turns out to evolve according to the principal symbol. It's a linear system. Uh, it's a linear system over, this is x of t and xi of t, so over the solution of the first two equations. Okay. So, uh, the question now becomes, if this amplitude grows exponentially in time, uh, does it mean that uh, the corresponding steady state is unstable? Does it mean that we can produce exponentially growing solutions of this equation? And the answer is yes. So, basically, if you introduce the maximal Lyapunov exponent of the B equation, then we know that uh, uh, the maximal growth rate of, of the semi-group is greater than or equal to nu. okay? And this is the first theorem that was produced by these four authors in the early 90s, okay? So there's a direct relationship between this geometric optics and stability uh, expressed by this inequality, so. Okay, so, but we need to know more about this. So first of all, somehow we're talking about some kind of continuous spectrum, right? So we're not, we want to connect these type of instabilities with the continuous spectrum. Um, and the way to do it is, uh, is the following. So first of all, let's understand a little more about, uh, about this system. So the first two equations, okay, these are, these are Hamiltonian, uh, this is a Hamiltonian system. Uh, it produces a flow on the cotangent bundle of the torus. Okay? Uh, what is this flow? And what's the Hamiltonian? So the Hamiltonian is the usual geometric optics Hamiltonian equal by direct product, uh, that product of the velocity field with the frequency. And uh, if uh, the solution to the first equation is phi, then uh, my flow C of T is given explicitly by phi Tx, phi inverse transposed Tx, C. okay? So that's the solution to the first two equations. Now the second equation is the equation over this flow. It's a non-autonomous system. So it produces uh, a classical cost cycle, uh, linear screw product flow. flow. Uh, and uh, the one thing that we need to remember is that we also have to satisfy these constraints somehow. The way these constraints enter into the system is they introduce this, this bundle over the cotangent space. So B at any point T has to belong to F of C of T. Okay, in order to respect the constraints. So here we have uh, the bundle. This is point omega, x xi. It gets transported to xi t of omega. 
And at each point, at this point, we have the corresponding fiber, okay? And uh, my cycle bt of omega is gonna map f of omega to f of c t omega. Okay, it's, it's not very appropriate to talk about this fundamental matrix of solution, although that's what it is basically, uh, because these may be non-trivial, like for divergence-free condition, it's gonna be a tangent bundle, right? So they map from one space to another. Okay, uh, now, Okay, so first of all, this cos cycle is gonna, is gonna be also homogeneous with respect to xi, and of course it's gonna be C infinity with respect to x and xi. Homogeneous because this symbol is homogeneous with respect to xi. So it makes sense, in fact, to talk about all of this on not this infinite dimension, uh, unbounded uh, manifold, but instead on the projectivized bundle, so torus cross sphere. And in fact, you can project this whole uh, flow on, on that compact object, and this becomes just another flow, that's, except that it's not measure preserving anymore, but that's not a problem. All right, so BT of X C is another symbol, okay? And it's natural to relate now this symbol to the semigroup e to the t uh, l. So the theorem uh, that we have is the following explicit representation of the semigroup. So e to the t l is equal to, very naturally, so this defines a flow and this defines another pseudo differential operator with the corresponding cos cycle. So it's an operator of with symbol BT uh, acting on V composed with the flow, okay? And of course, plus it's all up to a compact perturbation. And of course, I have to project this, all of this to the, fre to the uh, frequency constraint, like Larry Hope projection would be appropriate for the 3D Euler equation, for instance. Okay, so plus projection. But I'm not gonna write all the sort of little details because that actually can be avoided. I mean, doesn't, we can trivialize the semigroup on the uh, uh, orthogonal complement of the bundle and just talk about evolution without any constraint. Okay. Now, it's up to the compact operator very explicitly given, okay? It's operator composed with the flow. So we can put this guy into certain sister algebras, algebra of operators generated of this type basically, and uh, reduce the question of the spectrum of this evolution to a simpler question. Okay, so there's, with every cos cycle, uh, just to be specific, this is from L2 on the torus to L2 on the torus. Okay, so there's a method semigroup associated with this guy. So this semigroup is gonna map L2 of omega into L2 of omega, and it's given by the following. It's a weighted shift operator, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I introduce this uh, de determinant of one half to compensate for deformation. Uh, I don't want any exponential growth coming from uh, coming from the, the uh, change of variables, okay? This will compensate for the change of variables. So the type of the semigroup is intimately related to the, uh, to the uh, type of the cos cycle. And in fact, there is much more general theorem. So let me introduce what is called the sucker cell spectrum. So every cos cycle, just like every uh, semi-group um, uh, can, can be exponentially dichotomic. So we introduce those levels on which the, the cos cycle is, is dichotomic by the following, in the following way. So we say lambda belongs to cycle cell spectrum, it's a, just a piece of real axis, 
uh, if e to the minus t lambda bt is not exponentially dichotomic. And what does it mean to be exponentially dichotomic? It means that, that there exists, so in this case it does not exist, uh, a Whitney sum of the bundle into a stable and an unstable part. Meaning that if I take vectors from this stable part, this guy decays exponentially fast. And from unstable part, this guy grows exponentially fast. So if there's no such a, such a dichotomy, then uh, we call this uh, uh, point of the sucker cell spectrum. For example, if, if BT is equal to E to the TA, where A is a finite matrix, then uh, sucker cell spectrum is just the set of real values of the spectrum of A. Okay, so the theorem that we know about this semigroup is that the spectrum of the semigroup is equal to the e to the t sigma b. And sigma b is the union of solid intervals, okay, where the number of intervals is less than or equal to dimension of the bundle, okay. Well, it has to be like that because uh, because uh, you cannot possibly, with every spectral gap in the cycle cell spectrum comes the corresponding splitting of the bundle, but the dimension bundle is n, so you cannot split it into more spaces than there is the dimension. Okay, so um, now how do we connect now this spectrum with the spectrum of the semigroup? Uh, we use, okay, we have to uh, sort of introduce a certain isomorphism between uh, operator algebras generated by these guys and operator algebras generated by these guys. So we're looking at uh, sister algebra generated by symbols composed with shifts uh, with uh, the B characteristic flow. Okay? So you have two differential operators. Uh, sorry, uh, you have uh, symbols uh, composed with shifts, so you're looking at all possible master semigroups, of which this is, of course, a member, okay? On the other hand, we have a sister algebra of PDOs composed with shifts with our original Lagrangian flow, phi t, of which this semigroup is an object, is an element, okay? And now we arrange the map from symbols to PDOs, okay? This is called the classical quantization map. Uh, let me put it here. Which simply assigns the pseudo-differential operator with symbol, uh, with symbol A, but up to a compact operator, so modular compact, okay? Because we want this to be a sister algebra uh, homomorphism as well. And it will be by the rules of microlocal analysis. The composition of two operators is uh, operator of the composition of symbols plus something of lower order, which is compact. Um, so this guy, in fact, somehow respects compositions with the flows. This is a change of variable formula. If I have an operator of symbol A, uh, a acting on V, composed with phi minus t, composed with phi t. That's just another pseudo-differential operator with symbol to be A composed with the B characteristic flow, okay? If such thing occurs, we can extend this isomorphism to the isomorphism between these big two sister algebras. And this is called the isomorphism theorem. It goes back to uh, 69 by Arvison and there are many extensions. There are many names to, to, to call here. Peterson, Antonevich, and pretty much everybody has a book about it. So maybe I'll notice, note the one that used, Antonevich 98, volume one. So uh, it turns out that our setup completely embeds into the preconditions of this of this theorem, and so we can we can extend Q from C star to C star, and moreover, we know one beautiful fact, 
that E of ET is equal to E to TL. So to study the spectrum of this semigroup in, uh, in this algebra here, which is the same as Fredholm spectrum, study the Fredholm spectrum, is the same as to study the spectrum of this guy, which, of which we know a lot. So moreover, this is a theorem joined with Latushkin. We actually can show that this semigroup, the spectrum of this semigroup, is rotationally invariant. Okay? So if you look at the structure of the, uh, for all but countably many times t, okay, and that's a necessary clause to include because there are examples. So uh, basically the spectrum of the semigroup, the essential spectrum is, sorry, what am I saying? Is a bunch of concentric annuli. Okay. Now you may ask, can we say something more? Yes, we can. For example, for 3D and th uh, 2D Euler equation, there's only one annulus. Well, in 2D, that's trivial because in 2D, you have two spatial dimensions, but the, uh, the, f the bundle eats one dimension because of divergence free condition, so it's one dimensional, right? So by the Sucker cell spectrum theorem, there's only one interval. Now, why is it in 3D? In 3D, because it's a, it's a, tangent, bu uh, it's a tangent bundle to the sphere. If there, is a sp if there are two intervals, if there's a spectral gap in the Sucker cell, spectrum, it comes with the corresponding splitting, okay? So every fiber in, on a tangent bundle splits into a direct sum of two subspaces. In that case, there's a theorem in algebraic topology which says that you can also construct uh, two independent vector fields which belong to the corresponding spaces. So each vector field and non-vanishing, of course, unit. So that will be in contradiction with the hairy ball theorem. You cannot come to sphere with a non-trivial, non-vanishing vector field. Okay. You can actually extend this discussion, discussion to uh, more dimensional, uh, more dimensional uh, situations, and the geometry somehow of this bundle will put more restrictions on the number of uh, disconnected parts of the spectrum if there isn't a, 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 a corresponding algebraic topological argument that can be applied. Okay, so now let me talk about the other equation. So, <coughs> okay, just to mention, because these examples, these equations already appeared a lot in uh, this conference, SQG, there is no essential spectrum, neutral, okay? Just the unit circle, because somehow the symbol becomes purely imaginary, because the symbol of the relationship between temperature and the velocity is purely imaginary. Porous media, on the other hand, has non-trivial spectrum. So if you linearize about trivial velocity but non-trivial stratified density, uh, the corresponding spectrum will be the range of the derivatives of the density, okay? So if somewhere that derivative is positive, which corresponds, of course, to the unstable uh, situation, uh, you have a point in the essential spectrum uh, a po a, a, of positive value. So, uh, so the, the conclusion is that the classical porous media instability has, in fact, short wave character. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean that you cannot construct an, uh, an, an eigenfunction. Okay. You may still it may be embedded into a continuous spectrum. Another interesting situation, of course, is the Rayleigh-Taylor. Okay, so Rayleigh-Taylor, you have the momentum equation with the density and gravitational force, and the density is transported, and the divergence is free, is zero. Okay, so let's take another situation like this. Okay, the density is stratified and the flow is zero. It's a steady state and we can study stability. So it turns out that the result of one and Gua 2003, they found in fact this mu. Okay, they didn't know that that's that mu that came from here. 
They actually produced a variational formula even for mu, which is the same as that uh, uh, mu. Um, uh, and, and what they proved is the following in our language. So mu is equal to uh, the maximal or maximum of square root of g rho naught prime over y divided by rho naught of y over y such that rho naught prime is positive, okay? So if there is a really Taylor unstable fluid like this, if there's a heavier fluid on the top than it is on the bottom, then of course it produces mu. What they were able to prove is that this in fact is the total exponential growth rate of the semigroup. And they found that there is a sequence of eigenvalues monotonely conversion, conversion to mu. But the corresponding eigenfunctions of these eigenvalues have more and more frequencies in it. So in the limit, they weakly tend to zero, okay? So they could have, in fact, noticed already that this is a short path instability. Um, now, what do we do with this? Well, we want to, to say something about the nonlinear dynamics then, right? Can we pass from linear to nonlinear instability? Now, unfortunately, this is not uh, always possible. So there are a few results about this. Alfred Lander, Vishek, and, and uh, Strauss in 97 showed that if there is a spectral gap, spectral uh, gap condition, then it, linear implies nonlinear instability, okay, in some higher order Sobolev spaces. Spectral gap means that on the, this, if this is the unit disk, there should be some unstable part and stable part, and they should be well separated, okay? Now, we already know for 2D or 3D Euler equation, this is possible only if there is a separation between essential and the discrete spectrum. You cannot have these two continuous pieces uh, spread apart, okay? So that's just an interesting point to kind of in, in defense of why do we need to know about the structure of the essential spectrum. Um, now, the um, result, okay, so this is instability. Now, what about uh, existence of uh, unstable manifolds? Okay, so suppose we have uh, some uh, discrete spectrum inside or outside the essential spectrum. Well, it turns out that the existence of the uh, essential spectrum is the main obstacle for constructing the invariant manifolds in particular, it's an obstacle for the classical lyapunov piron method. But um, Chun Chun Zhen and Zhu Lin, okay, very recently in 2013, were able to avoid this. I mean, were able to construct invariant manifolds provided there are eigenvalues which are far away, sufficiently far away from the essential spectrum. So if there exists an eigenvalue, for the 3U, uh, 3D Euler, any Euler, such that lambda is greater than some very large constant times mu, large but fixed, okay? Then you have a classical picture. You have a steady state, you have the spectral subspace corresponding to the lambda, and there is an unstable manifold to the nonlinear equation, which exists in some higher order Sobolev spaces. Uh, and what they did, they were able to employ this Arnold, uh, Arnold Hamiltonian approach to the Euler equation, the path to the Lagrangian coordinates, and they were able to run the, uh, uh, the lyapunov peron method in that framework, and then go back to the original, uh, original uh, coordinates. Um, now, we ask the same question, can we apply it to other equations, particularly to really, really Taylor? Well, unfortunately, this is the largest Lyapunov exponent. So there is no, I mean, this is the growth rate of the semigroup. They may not be discrete points outside. Um, the theorem itself, by the way, just directly uh, trans, uh, carries over to the really Taylor uh, case. And that, that was actually our joint uh, work very recently. But I can tell you there is nothing really new because when you pass to Lagrangian coordinates, the scalar is just a fixed parameter. So we just added one dimensional one dimension to the manifold, and I mean these are the two of the serious mathematicians here <laughs> of the three. <laughs> so we did it quickly. Okay, but the question is was how, how can we apply it? How can we remove the essential spectrum? 
And the answer came at the shear. So where's the shear? Okay. Something magical happened, which we didn't expect. And what, how many, how much time do I have? Okay, good. So what we did, we wrote down that amplitude system. And by the way, here the natural setup is in fact periodic in X and infinite in Y, okay? So we have to change a little, we had to change a lot to actually obtain this thing first, okay? We had to go back to very basics of the pseudo-differential <laughs> analysis and to develop some uh, compactness criteria which extends some of the classical results. So what we need in order for all of this to work is some kind of decay at infinity. So from U mod, we require the first and the second derivative to go to zero. And rho node, of course, it tends to, it has to tend to some constant at infinity. Uh, and the, again, the first and second derivatives vanish. Okay, so they have to behave well basically, and it's only the first two derivatives that uh, we need to control. Um, so we wrote down the system, okay? Now we have uh, amplitude that consists of the velocity amplitude and of course the density amplitude, okay? I'm gonna call them B and R. So here is the equation for the B. Okay, this is the Euler part, just like in 3D Euler. Plus R, and then, of course, the gravitation. Ah, uh, here, everything is Y. Okay, so this is the equation for B. The equation for R is, it's subordinate to the B equation. Okay? So, so if the share is zero, then this simplifies to the following sturm liouville periodic problem. So B2 double dot is equal to uh, G rho naught prime divided by rho naught B. And so you can recover that exponent of uh, Juan and, uh, and Gu explicitly, right? Because if, if, that, if that coefficient is, is positive, you have exponentially growing solution. If it's negative, they just oscillate. They don't grow anywhere. And the exponent is, of course, square root of this. By the way, this sometimes is called the Atwood number. It's a continuous analog of the classical Atwood number. If shear is not zero, then this becomes a bit more complicated sturm liouville problem. You still see that output number, but it's embedded in more complicated system. Okay? And after, if u naught prime is not zero, okay, then after a few changes of variables, you arrive at the following uh, Euler equation. Euler or DE, I mean. Okay? And for that Euler or DE, you, you, you apply the asymptotic expansion in time and you see that the solutions grow only polynomially. Okay? So existence of shear all of a sudden removes, neutralizes the essential spectrum. It collapses to the neutral. Okay? And in that case, the mu is in fact equal to supremum over all y, such that rho naught prime is positive and u naught prime is zero of the output number, square root of the output. Okay? So if you have a shear that 
grows monotonically, okay? Or it oscillates, but the critical points, but the critical points are points where you have really tailoring st uh, stability. So the density behaves like this, it decays, but it may do whatever it wants otherwise, then you have a neutral essential spectrum. But for oscillatory shear flows, you can, just like for the Euler equation, you can produce a lot of examples with unstable eigenvalues. Okay, there's a classical Fadeev theorems, and then it's a classical uh, approach, and it extends here uh, as well. So, okay, so the, the final theorem is that if, if, uh, u naught prime uh, is not equal to zero where rho naught uh, prime is positive and there exists a point in the spectrum of L, then you have classical local dynamics, namely you have stable uh, and unsta uh, you have stable manifold, uh, sorry, unstable manifolds corresponding to, to the spectral subspaces here, and therefore you can pass from linear to nonlinear instability. So you can prove. A real part is positive, of course. Yeah, like I said, uh, if uh, if uh, so, this is the situation. This is going to be the essential spectrum, okay? And you may have some points of the uh, discrete spectrum outside. Um, but like I said, uh, yeah, you take very oscillatory, th there should be inflection points, of course. So you, you, you take oscillatory, like Kolmogorov flows, and they will produce you these non-trivial lambdas. You can use continuous fraction technique, for example, uh, to produce more or less explicitly uh, the uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, eigenfunctions more than eigenvalues. Eigenvalues just prove existence. Um, well, I guess that's all I had to say. Thank you.